Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to um, to everybody for joining us tonight. I know that you know this has been a very long year plus. Um, we didn't expect to spend this much time together on Zoom, but we're making it work and we've, we've had some fun with it. So I thank you guys for continuing to support our library and our programming efforts. I wanna thank my colleagues, Sam and Tani. Sam is adult services librarian and Eastgate branch manager. And Tani is new to our district. Um, she is the adult services librarian and she's working on our fiction collection over here at the Harnish Main Library. So if you haven't been in to visit us, you will most likely see her on the floor. So make sure you say hi to her. And most importantly, we are welcoming Mary tonight. Um, I would hope that most of you know who she is because you signed up for this event, but maybe you don't. Maybe you're just really into books and reading and authors and that's cool too. So again, please hold your questions till the end. Feel free to, to put them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll get back to them. Just, don't get upset. We're not ignoring you. We're just going to walk through our through our program and then we'll get back and answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, so if you don't know who Mary is or you have a slight idea, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Sam, who's going to introduce her for us tonight. Thank you, Kate. Uh, so Mary Kabika is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of six novels, The Good Girl, Pretty Baby, Don't You Cry, Every Last Lie, When the Lights Go Out, and The Other Misses. A former high school history teacher, Mary lives in the suburbs of Chicago with her husband and children. She's been described as a hell of a storyteller by Kirkus Reviews and a writer of vice-like control by the Chicago Tribune. And her novels have been praised widely by critics everywhere. Mary's next novel, Local Woman Missing, will be published in May. Thank you, Sam. Mary, before we start your interview, is there anything else you wanted to add about yourself that you'd like people to know or? Uh, um, I don't know. Um, I think that Sam pretty much covered it. Um, I'm a runner. Uh, I volunteered at an animal shelter. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> but I, I think that I think Sam got the basics there in the bio. But I just want to say that um, I'm so excited to be here tonight and um, I'm just so glad that you know we're able to do this virtually. I know that you know, we were talking before about not being able to do as many in-person events, but I'm so glad that we're able to make the most of technology and um, that I'm able to do so many events like this with, with libraries. Awesome, and thank you again for, for joining us. It's really cool. All right, so we're gonna jump right in guys and get into books and writing and I think it's gonna be fun. <laughs> So I want to start by discussing your most recent novel, The Other Misses, which was published just over a year ago in February of 2020, right before um, everything kind of went crazy and hasn't really gone back since. A uh, number of bloggers, reviewers, critics have all stated that um, that book has one of the most surprising endings that they've ever read. <laughs> Without giving too much away, would you please share a summary of the book for those who haven't had the chance to read it yet? Absolutely. Yeah, The Other Misses is, is about um, a Chicago family. It's Will and Sadie Faust and their two sons, Otto and Tate, and they inherit a home um, on a small remote island off the coast of Maine when Will, the father, um, when his sister dies. And so they've had just kind of a number of bad things happen to them in Chicago, personally and professionally. So it's it's a good time for them to leave Chicago behind and start fresh. So they they move um, onto this island in, off the coast of Maine. And um, not only though do they inherit the home, but they also get guardianship of Will's 16 year old teenage niece, who is um, not very happy that this family she barely knows is moving into her home with her. Her mother's just died and her father has never really been in the picture. So things kind of get off to a rocky start from the beginning, but then they get even worse when the neighbor right across the street winds up murdered and all, all people in this tight knit community look suspiciously at the Faust family and think that they might have had or one of them might have had something to do with it. And Sadie, the mother realizes that the only way to clear her family's name is to find the killer for herself. And I would recommend you guys check it out if you haven't already. Um, I did put a link to where you can find it through the Algonquin Library in the chat there. Um, it, it was a very surprising ending. I will give you that. It was, 
<laughs> I wasn't ready. So <laughs> um, that being said, did the inspiration for the plot and the characters for this book come to you as they have in the past with your last uh, five novels? So this book was a little different in that I, I thought of the ending or a, a version of the ending first. I didn't have the whole ending figured out, but um, I knew like one of the big twists. And that was actually, that twist was the inspiration for the book. So for obvious reasons, I can't go into that in any detail. But um, but when you when you read the book, just know that the twist was kind of my starting point for this book. And so, you know, I really, I created the Faust family and, you know, their whole story just as, you know, as a means to get to this end that I had planned. So it was definitely a different way of writing. Um, with the majority of my books, I have that starting point, but I have no idea where the story is going to go. And I have no idea what my twist is going to be. And I just sort of, you know, I, I start writing and get to know my characters and just get deeper and deeper into the story. And then the twist kind of develops from that. So this was actually a much different writing experience. You know, there was a lot of comfort in it, I have to say, in knowing where I was headed, but it was just so different because I'd never known that before. So it was, it was like I said, it was definitely different from the other books that I've written, but, um, but good, really good in a different way. Just there was that comfort. I wasn't having the panic like I sometimes do, you know, like 200 pages into it when I start to worry that these pieces are not all going to come together. <laughs> You know, following along with that, um, given the subject matter of the other misses, did you have to do a lot of research? And in general, do you find yourself getting caught up in the research when you're planning? Yeah, yes and yes. <laughs> um, I did. You know, there was there there was a lot of research that I had to do on this book. Um, for one is the subject matter that we can't talk too much about. Um, but um, I had to learn a lot about that. And again, when you do read the book, that's, you know, you'll know what you're, we're talking about. But um, so that was where I really spent the majority of my research because I wanted to make absolutely sure I got that right. Um, and, and the rest, though, was on Maine itself, really. Um, I've been to Maine before. For, but I've actually never stepped foot on a main island. And so um, I did a lot of research just into, you know, what it's like to live on one of these main islands. And, it, you know, you have to take the ferry from the island back to the mainland. So if you, you know, work on the, the mainland and live on the island, what's that commute like? Or if you go to school on the mainland and live on the island, what's that like? And, um, and the weather, you know, it's this book I, I set late fall, early winter. So the weather is turning. And as, as the book, you know, gets deeper and deeper, a big blizzard comes. And, and so I, you know, learns about the weather in Maine and just things like that. And um, so I think that those two things were really where the bulk of my research came from for this book. But I, I am always falling down these rabbit holes of research. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that like 90% of it never gets into the book. But I just find myself looking up something and just like completely sucked in and learning so much more than I ever needed to know or I'm, that I'm ever going to use in the book. But, um, but I just like to sort of absorb it all and then be able to just talk a little bit more fluently about whatever it, whatever the subject matter is in my books. But yeah, I, I think that that's really one of the most surprising slash fun things about writing. You know, I never really thought about all the very random things I was going to learn about through this process, but, but there've been a number of them. That makes a lot of sense. Like a lot of people don't think about how much research goes in involved into writing something. Um, you said that The Other Misses is sort of a departure for you in two ways. Um, one, this was your first novel that you wrote voice to character using the third person point of view. And two, this is the first book you've set entirely out of Chicago, like you said, in Maine. What inspired you to make these changes? Um, so the, the third person narrator is a child in this book. And um, I've, I've always, like you said, I've always written in first person point of view for, with, for multiple narrators in all of my books. And um, when I started doing that with my first book, The Good Girl, it was, it, there was, um, I don't even remember making that choice. You know, it was just sort of the way the book flowed out of me. And then um, I think it, like my second or third book, I initially started in third person. And as I started writing it, I realized 
that I felt somehow removed from the story and removed from my characters. Like I felt like I was writing this story, but I was outside, you know, just looking through a window and kind of describing what I saw, but I wasn't part of the story myself. And that was one of the things that I had loved, you know, with my, my with the good girl, for example, like it just felt like when it was in the first person and I was saying, you know, I did this and I did that. And I was speaking, you know, through my characters or my characters are speaking through me. I just had such an intimate connection with them. I, I got to know them so well, you know, and I really got to put myself in their shoes and think, you know, if, if I was in this position, what would I do? And, and so I, I felt like I got really close to my characters. And so in the third person, I didn't feel that way. So I, I sort of made a decision at that point that I will probably always write in the first person perspective. But in um, The Other Misses, the character is a child. And um, I really worried, she's a young child. She's, she's six years old, I believe. Um, and I really, really worried that I wasn't going to make it authentic, that it just wasn't going to ring true. And I, wa I wanted to make sure, her story is a very, very important one. And so I wanted to make sure that, that I got it just right. So removing myself, her story is also, it's, it's pretty emotional. Um, so I feel like removing myself a step from her story really allowed me to get it across um, better than if I had done it in the first person. So that was why I made that decision. Um, as for as for moving the book to Maine and not keeping it in Chicago, I was just I started to think about just the atmosphere and the isolation of these Maine islands and how this story would be so different, you know, set on the streets of Chicago than on this remote little island. Um, things like law enforcement, the police, um, medical emergencies, all of that kind of comes into play in this book. And you know, here on this island, there are two police officers, and there's um, there's like a clinic, but the nearest hospital is is a ferry ride away. So, um, you know, I just, I loved the idea of, you know, moving the people here and putting them on this island because then when there are these crises or when, oh my gosh, suddenly we have a killer loose and the killer's trapped on the island because the ferry is taken off for the night, you know, how does that really um make the stakes that much higher. So, so that was kind of my reason for wanting to take this book out of Chicago and just really play with the atmosphere and see what I could do to kind of like ratchet up the tension with that. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that. Like when I was reading it, like how much more difficult it would be versus Chicago, like if I call the police, they're going to be here in two minutes, but it's not really the same situation. Right. Yeah. And I just love that. I love like kind of the closeness, you know, I mean that when they're literally, when, she, you know, Sadie realizes that they're really trapped on this island with a killer and, and just also the kind of the coldness of the characters, you know, this, the spouse family, they are definitely outsiders here. The people on this island are not warm and welcoming, you know, so um, they really, it just kind of, you know, they don't have anybody that they can rely on when, you know, things start to go bad and people are looking at them suspiciously. It's really just them. And, and there's a lot of conflict within the family too. So, um, so I had, I, I had a lot of fun just kind of playing around with all those things because it was so different than any book that I've ever set in Chicago where, you know, those things don't necessarily come into play. The other misses highlights your talent for developing unreliable narrators to say the least. Um, <laughs> what draws you to these unreliable narrators? Um, it's funny because I don't think I ever, I don't think that's ever intentional, but I think I make there, I have unreliable narrators in all my books. Um, and, you know, I think, I think because I do think that um, unreliable narrators are pretty common in this genre, but I think that for me, at least the way to do it right is where I think it's, if, if the narrator is just out outright lying to the reader, then that that's feels manipulative, manipulative. And I don't think that that makes for a very satisfying reading experience for the reader. So when I do want somebody to be a little um, unreliable, you know, I really try and think of other reasons, you know, that will be sort of understandable at some point when you get to the end of the book and understand what's happening. Um, but I think that for a reader, you know, here's this narrator that, you know, you're like going on this road trip with and, you know, you're, you're stuck with them for the whole 350 pages of the book or whatever. And you're, you're listening to their story and you want to be able to trust them. But as a reader, you don't know, you know, some things just sound a little off. 
And so just, you know, in that part of the story, like regardless of, of what is happening within the plot, I feel like that alone, it becomes unsettling for the reader. You know, can they trust everything this person is telling them and, you know, trying to figure out what is believable, what is not and all that. So I, I just, I think that it's a great place where a writer can, you know, plot aside, they can just kind of work that tension into the novel. Okay, great. And then you've stated that you have a tendency to write each of the voices from beginning to end before picking up with another voice and writing that character's point of view. Does the first perspective that you tackle, tackle typically guide you through the nuances of the plot? It does. So, um, and that was something that I started just in my first book, The Good Girl 2. And it was, it was random. You know, I think that I just, I started on one of my narrators and I liked the writing was flowing and I felt very comfortable with that narrator. So I just saw that, that, that narrator story all the way through, you know, and then I jumped back and I picked a different perspective and told their story and sort of, you know, I wove the, the different narrations together. And it was something that I, you know, just a way of writing that I kind of fell in love with because I realized realized I can connect with each of these narrators so much more closely and also I can I can be true to their voice. I, I always feel like if I'm bopping from character to character with each chapter that I'm never really going to get that true voice back you know when I start a new a new chapter or it's going to be more difficult and take more time to really get it right so this way you know I, I with um the other misses I wrote Sadie's whole story first and then I went back and there's a character named Camille and then one named Allison so um, I wrote them each one at a time. And yes, I did figure out, you know, the vast majority of the plot as I was writing Sadie's story. And then I would write Camille, but that, that didn't mean that, you know, like in Camille's storyline, I might think of something and, you know, think of a way that it can intersect with Sadie's story then. And so I'll jump back into that part of the book and, and work something in. So um, sometimes when I describe it, it sounds like utter chaos, but I actually feel like it's one way that I can sort of simplify things because I'm just working on one person's story. A lot of my books aren't linear also. And, and that's the case with this. These three storylines are not linear. They're all set in their their own time for the most part. Um, so I didn't have to worry about, you know, making sure that that all went together. You know, there was, I was able to play around with that a little bit. So uh, my characters, I feel like they're very important to me. Um, and, you know, I just feel like readers for, I want the reader to care about my character. It doesn't mean that they have to like them or to agree with everything that they're doing, but I feel like they have to relate to my, my characters or at least understand, I guess, you know, see the motive behind why my characters are doing the things that they're doing. So creating really authentic characters is important to me. So any, any, anything that I can find to do as a writer to make my characters more genuine and believable, you know, I try to do that. And this is one of the ways that, that I feel like I can do that better. Yeah, I can see that from a reader's point of view. I mean, generally, if I don't, I guess, not necessarily empathize, but if I don't like the narrator right off, I'm just not going to read the book. So <laughs> Sometimes I don't end up liking your narrators by the end, but it's <laughs> part of the genre. That's part of the fun of it. <laughs> um, so that was, yeah, that was also my next part was that um, it just, it blows me away is that, you know, you don't only have me trusting them, like, but then I'm empathizing with them and I like them. Um, <laughs> so let's see, where's my question? Okay, we kind of answered it, but we'll go back over it. Um, do you find it hard to develop such sympathetic yet ultimately tr untrustworthy characters, even as you deliver hints about their true nature, develop the plot, elevate tension, and ultimately expose them for who they are? You know, it's, um, it can be tricky, definitely, but I, I feel like you know, I mean, obviously in this genre, people are doing some extreme things and they're making some terrible choices, you know, to get themselves in the situations that they're in. Um, but I do like to think that I start with, you know, everyday ordinary people for the most part, you know, they could be any one of us. And then I put them in these really terrible situations and kind of see what they do. So in that regards, I, I feel like with my characters, um, 
again, even though they're going to make terrible decisions, they feel like there's some part about them that's that's relatable. Um, you know, like Sadie and, and the other misses, I know that she can strike some people as cold and, you know, she, she definitely has her faults. But I feel like she's, I think I empathized with her because um, she's a mother, you know, and I, I could see that she was struggling with her children, but she was, she was very aware of the fact that she was struggling and wanting to be a better mother and, you know, to figure out what had kind of gone wrong in those relationships. And so I feel like there's, there's always some way that, you know, that a reader can connect with them. So even if, again, she's making these horrible decisions and, you know, doing some things that we're, we're, we don't really understand, I feel like there are some parts about her that are just really relatable too. So, and, and that's the way it is with, with many of my characters. I mean, some of them, this, this character Camille in this book is pretty unlikable. <laughs> But, um, you know, so sometimes you get that, but I feel like for the most part, you know, there's something that is definitely relatable about them or something that, that you as a reader can empathize with. Uh, the fact that you base a lot of your novels in Chicago is a big draw for your readers. Why do you choose Chicago? Um, well, I, I live, well, I'm in the suburbs now, but uh, right after college, I did live in the city for a while. And I just feel like this is, this is home, you know, and um, I feel like I can kind of get that setting right without having to reach, you know, I, I don't have to do the research and all, which I love the research, but sometimes it's nice to just kind of, um, you know, put it in a place that I feel really comfortable, um, you know, and I can picture sometimes, you know, if I want to describe the setting, I can, I can picture them in certain locations, whether it's the city or the suburbs. My next book is set um, in, a, in a suburb very much like my own. And so, you know, I was able to really pull a lot of those landmarks in and, in, and include them. And, you know, the street that the characters live on is, is you know, very similar to mine. And so I just feel like I was able to kind of step outside and, you know, take things in and write about it. And so, so there's a comfort there um, that, that I don't have, you know, even when I wrote about Maine and, and I loved it and did a lot of research about it, there's always the fear of, am I getting this right? You know, is someone from Maine going to tell me that I got this all wrong? Whereas with Chicago, I feel like I know that that's not going to happen. And as a reader, I have to say, I love reading books set in Chicago too. Like it's so fun when you can be like, oh, I know that place and you know, I've been there and, and you can just picture it. So I think that too, you know, knowing how I feel about that as a reader also, um, you know, it, it, it is the equivalent to being, to writing about. And I, and I love to hear from readers, you know, how much they like the Chicago setting. Yeah, I remember, I, I think it was Don't You Cry. You mentioned the Barrington Metro Station. Yeah, and yeah. I was just like, ah, when I saw that, I like took a picture of it and sent it to my mom. And I was like, <laughs> I go there all the time. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, so are there other writers who said a lot of their novels in Chicago that have inspired you to do the same? And along those same lines, could you share a few authors who have made you want to write or have inspired your own works in general? Yeah, you know, as for Chicago, I think um, the Time Traveler's Wife is is one that just the it just I mean it got Chicago so right to me. I just um, I don't know. I just I just felt you know like I was there, and I just I loved it so much when I was reading that book. Um, I read I do read I read pretty widely. I would say that. Um, uh, this is, you know, suspense, thrillers, that's definitely my go-to genre. I love historical fiction as well. And, you know, on my bucket list, maybe one day is to try and write a historical fiction. But um, I feel like every time I read, um, I'm always just really, I'm paying attention. I'm learning from authors. So it's hard to pinpoint one author or one book in particular that has really, um, you know, um, inspired or motivated me, but I feel like I'm always being inspired and motivated by everything that I read. You know, I'm, I'm just figuring out different ways that, that authors do things, um, you know, whether it's just, you know, some beautiful dialogue or beautiful prose that I'm really taken with or, or words that they're, you know, exposing me to that I wasn't familiar with. And I always keep a list of words that I run across, you know, in books that I just am really drawn to, or it's a word that, you know, I never use. And I think, why don't I use that? You know, and I'll put it on the list. And so I feel like I'm always learning. I think in this genre too, um, you know, I feel like that twist has become everything in, in suspense novels. And, and the more authors that kind of enter this genre, the harder and harder it is to, um, to, to, to surprise the readers. And so I'm always thinking, you know, how, how can I do that differently? And, and I know, um, 
um, Peter Swanson a couple of years ago, The Kind Worth Killing, he came out with a book where, um, and really Gone Girl kind of does do this too, where it's like 50% of the way in is a shocking twist, you know? And so that was kind of like a learning experience for me thinking, oh, the big twist doesn't have to come, you know, five pages from the end, you can put a big twist in anywhere. So, um, so it's one of those things that I feel like I'm just taking it all in. But um, Peter Swanson is an author, I think it's fabulous. Um, S.J. Watson, Kimberly McCrite, um, um, Jillian McMillan. There are just there's just so many really Jennifer Hillier in this in this genre. There are just so many brilliant minds out there. Speaking of Jillian Flynn, was Gone Girl like a big deal for you? Like it was for everyone else who was <laughs> for? I mean. I did, I did very much like it. Um, um, yeah, that, I mean, that book just, I feel like took the, the world by storm, you know, and I really feel like it laid the groundwork for this genre. I mean, I think until Gone Girl came out, you know, I mean, I obviously like mysteries have always been popular, but that domestic suspense, the psychological suspense, I feel like it really took off with Gone Girl. And so I feel just like forever grateful that she kind of opened that door for all these suspense authors. Yeah, I agree. I feel like she kind of busted it down and not only just for um, like suspense authors, but women in particular, um, I felt like right after that was like, it was like your, you know, our time to shine, which was really cool. You know, like Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. Pop that up for us. All right. We're, I know I lost track because I went off script. Um, so speaking <laughs> of inspiration, what initially inspired you to pursue writing and what was your path to publication like? Yeah, so I um, I started writing when I was like 12. I feel like many authors have a similar experience, but um, I'd always been a big reader growing up. And then actually when I was a girl, um, I was at a sleepover with a cousin of mine and she had written this story that she shared with me. And I was totally blown away by her story, but just also this idea of, you know, creating my own stories and, you know, um, being able to create these worlds and characters from scratch. So it was just something that I started right away when I was, I was probably like 12-ish, like middle school sometime. Um, and I just, you know, I wrote whenever I had a chance um, after school, I'd come home and I'd write on the weekends. And, um, uh, but it was never anything that I thought I would want to pursue professionally. Like when I was writing at that age, um, it was very private, you know, um, I just, or it was private and I, I was shy. Like I didn't know if the writing was any good and I didn't really want to share it with anybody and find out. And so, you know, I just kept it very much to myself. Self, but but honestly, like I can't remember a time that I wasn't writing from the time I discovered it. You know, it was into high school, into college. Um, but but again, I never I, I never thought I want to be an author. You know, I never pursued creative writing classes or tried to join a writers group or anything like that. It was just definitely um, a pastime of mine. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be a teacher, so I studied I studied to become a high school history teacher, and I taught in the suburbs of Chicago for a while, and then for a few years. Um, um, my husband, we were relocated out to Omaha for his job. So I taught in the Omaha public schools. But again, you know, continued to write whenever I had some time. And then in 2005, we were living out in Omaha at the time and my daughter was born. And so I decided to leave my teaching career for a while and start my family. And it was then when I was home with her, we were in Omaha, our whole family's in Chicago. So I think that I was feeling maybe a little isolated. I don't, I don't know, um, but I started working on The Good Girl then. Um, and it's funny because now she's 15 and I can barely write anything while she's home. <laughs> you know, doing school remotely. And I think, how did I do this when she was an infant? But I started writing The Good Girl then, um, and I wrote it totally in secrecy. Um, so my husband knew it, he knew I was working on it. We shared one computer, so I knew eventually he would find it. So I told him about it, but I didn't tell anybody else that I was writing. In fact, most people that knew that I liked to write as a girl had assumed, you know, I stopped talking about it. So they assumed that I had given it up. Um, so I spent five years writing The Good Girl. I have a son who's just two years younger than my daughter. So soon I had two little ones at home and, um, you know, finding the time to write, you know, where they were both napping or just occupied, it was pretty difficult. So, you know, at most I would maybe get 30 minutes here or there, but I just, I fell in love with that book and those characters in a way that I, I hadn't anything I'd ever written before. And I think at some point, you know, midway through the manuscript, I kind of told myself, 
that I was going to finish this no matter what. It was the first thing that I felt really, really that I just had to, you know, if even if I just finished it for myself, I had to finish this book. So, so I did. And then when it was done, you know, it was the first thing also that I can, I felt compelled to kind of put out there and see if there was any chance I could get this thing published. So I had no idea what I was doing. You know, again, I never studied creative writing. I had no contacts. You know, I'd never, I never spoken to an author. I was nowhere on social media. Like I, I knew nothing, um, but I, I did some research on the internet and I got a book called The Writer's Market and it lists all these literary agents. And um, so I started, I wrote up a query letter and I started sending it out to all these literary agents. And again, like my husband hadn't so much as proofread the manuscript. So I'll look for like typos. And you know, so, I mean, it was, it was, it was messy. Um, but I, I sent it out to all these agents. I didn't keep great track, but I think like 75 plus agents I sent um, the good girl or my query letter to. And um, there were three agents of all of those that did ask to read the entire manuscript. But ultimately, every single one of these agents rejected it. And so I thought, you know, well, that book's never going to be published. And I was, I was definitely sad. Um, I was more than sad. You know, I was, I was really, I was pretty heartbroken. But I also, I also think that there was a part of me that knew that that was the likely outcome, you know. Um, so I, I moved on. I started writing something else. I don't, I don't know what it is or where it is because it just didn't grab me the way that the good girl had. You know, I just really felt at that point in my life that was the best that I could do. And two years after that final rejection came in, one of these agents reached back out to me. And it just so happened that the first time she read The Good Girl, um, she was right out of college. She was um, brand new to this literary agency. She was working as an assistant to somebody else. So she, she wasn't taking on her own clients, but she had gone through the slush pile, came across um, The Good Girl, took it home and read it and fell in love with it. And then the, the next day she just couldn't get her team on board. You know, they just, it wasn't what they were looking for. And so she had to pass, you know, on, on her team's behalf. Well, within the next two years, she was promoted from an assistant to her own, you know, literary agents. And she remembered The Good Girl for two years and reached back out to me to see if, if it was still available, if I'd sold it. So it was, um, it was kind of a dream come true, you know, and it, it, in retrospect, I feel like it was totally worth it because I knew that she was as passionate about that book as I was. So, um, so she and I worked together uh, for a few months, kind of cleaned up the book a little bit. Um, and then she, this was like 2012 by this time. So I'd started it in 2005. But by the end of that year, she was sending it off to publishers. And at this point, I still hadn't told anybody. My, like my parents didn't know any of this was going on and my husband still hadn't read the book. Um, but so she was submitting it to publishers and I, I was fortunate enough to get two offers on the same day. And I was able to have a conversation with both of these editors who were both, who were both lovely. I would have been very fortunate to end up with either of them. But um, the editor that I, I went with, um, who's still my editor today, she she kind of terrified me on the phone. I just, I just knew that she was going to push me really hard to make that book the absolute best it could be, you know, before it went out there. And she also offered me a two book deal, which was, it was terrifying because I had one book, you know, that had taken five years to write. And she said, upfront, this book cannot, the second book cannot take you another five years to write. So I knew there would be deadlines and it would be a much different situation, but it was, um, you know, this chance to take, take this one book I'd written and, you know, make a career of something that I'd love to do since I was a little girl. That's a really cool story. Um, if you don't feel comfortable answering this, that's fine. So when, even when you were like 12, did you always know you wanted to write like thrillers or were it just other things that you were working on, other genres? Yeah. You know, until I wrote The Good Girl, I had actually never written anything remotely suspenseful I don't think I mean maybe something probably something when I was a girl you know but um nothing I remember I had written it was all more um before the good girl I would say a lot of the things I was writing would classify more as women's fiction and you know even even when I was younger I felt like it was very it was more you know just like YA literature you know it didn't have that suspense in it and actually when I started writing the good girl I had no idea that that's what I was writing <laughs> and it was you know I thought I was writing a love story <laughs> and then little by little things started to happen and I'd get an idea and work it in and all of a sudden it was you know this really dark 
novel. And, and I started to realize though that that, you know, those suspense elements and those twists and turns were for me as a writer, personally, what was missing from everything that I had previously written. You know, it was why I loved writing, but I didn't have that really strong connection to anything I'd written until The Good Girl. Yeah, it's definitely not not what I would call like a love story, but <laughs> I love it. It's very good. So thank you. Um, now, do you maintain a certain writing schedule? And how do you de-stress when the pressure of writing under a deadline, which I assume you are always under now um, that you have your book deal, um, starts to get to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I my 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 writing routine has changed a gazillion times over the years, basically just based on my kids' schedules. So, um, you know, when they were really young, when I sold The Good Girl and I was already under contract for my second book, Pretty Baby, my son was in preschool still. And he he went like, like four hours a week <laughs> to preschool. And, you know, it was like 20 minutes away. And so by the time there was just no time to write when he was at preschool. So I got in the habit then of waking up at five every day and I would write, you know, religiously from like five to seven when the kids got up. And um, I mean, I, Pretty Baby was literally written, you know, between the hours of five and seven. And that was it. You know, I think I think that when you're when you're when you don't have a lot of time, you maximize every second. Now, you know, they're older and they are, you know, um, well, they have like a hybrid situation now. So they're in school two mornings a week and then home the rest of the week. So but but they're 13 and 15. So they're pretty independent, too. But I also find, you know, when you have more time that you don't make the most of it, you know, it's a little bit easier to procrastinate then. So, so typically right now I do still wake up at five and, you know, I'll try and get some writings on early, but like my daughter for high school, she's up by like five 30 getting ready for school. And then, you know, I'll kind of help her get, you know, get, go through the morning routine and stuff and then come back to writing when I can. So, um, so it's just, it's adapted, you know, based on the kid's schedule really. Um, but the writing under a deadline and pressure and all that, um, it's, you know, I, I have to say the deadline, the pressure, it does get to me. I'm a fast writer. And I have to say that I've always turned my manuscripts in ahead of time. Um, I don't know if that will be the case with the next book. But, um, but I think that the, you know, the deadline pressure just makes me think, keep writing, keep writing. But I also love to write, you know? So for me, so many, so many nights when I go to bed and I think it sounds so sad, but when I think I get to get it up at 5 a.m. and write, you know, I'm actually excited to do that. So, you know, I mean, it's, I feel really fortunate that I, I get to do a live, you know, do something that I love so much for a living. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't always feel like work when I have to get on the laptop and write. But that said, with COVID, things have, have been more difficult, you know, with the kids home. My husband has been home for a year now. So I like to write when it's quiet, you know, and I can really like immerse myself in my manuscript. And I think that that's the thing that has really been missing in the last year is, yeah, my kids are independent and things like that, but I don't feel like it's a really immersive experience when I'm writing. And as a result, I'm just not connecting as much with my characters in the story. So, so this one that I'm working on now has just been a little bit more of an uphill battle is kind of everything for everybody has been in the last year. Yeah, very true. Um, that being said, with COVID and the pandemic, did you find that you just weren't as motivated just because I, I certainly wasn't. There was a lot of days where I was like, I'm going to play Animal Crossing today and that's going to be my entire day. <laughs> no, you're, you're, it's so true. And I mean, I think that it's, I think everybody, well, most people feel the same way, you know, um, I know early on, you know, all I would have to do is look at the news and I'd be devastated and there was nothing creative coming out of me after that, you know, and um, I, I think that I've adapted some, but yeah, you know, I mean, this, this lifestyle right now, and I think, I think we're just at this, scent, like this heightened anxiety all the time. So it's, I feel like it's hard to be creative, you know, um, so, um, you know, and I, I, my life, I mean, I've, I've always, I've been working at home, you know, for how many years now? And so like that part of it hasn't changed, but, but a lot of other things have changed. So there's some, been some exciting news. So Netflix has um, acquired the rights to the other misses and it's going to be made into a featured film. And that's really exciting. Well, what has that experience been like for you knowing that one of your books is going to be made into a movie? Yeah, so that's been, that's been super exciting. Um, when the offer came in from Netflix, I was just 
ecstatic. I mean, it was just beyond my wildest dreams. Um, so I, I have a film agent, her name's um, Sherry Smiley. And she, as soon as the book was done, it was, it was like a year before it was actually published, but my end of it is done like a year in advance. And then after that, it's, you know, cover design and proofreaders and all of that. But so as soon as, as we had a good, uh, it was done, um, Sherry took it out to Hollywood, different producers. And so this offer came in from Netflix and um, I just feel like even despite the pandemic, I feel like w these days lately, we want to we want to be home watching shows, you know, in our own living rooms. And so I just felt like Netflix was the perfect home for it. Um, so I um, they have a screenplay. They uh, a man named Jack Thorne wrote the screenplay and, and he's pretty phenomenal. He's done a lot of wonderful things. He, he wrote the screenplay for Wonder. Um, he wrote a Harry Potter play that was on Broadway. So he's just done a lot of really terrific things. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but that's done and they have a producer and an executive producer and I know that right now they're in the process of looking for a director and then I think after that they would they would begin casting so there was definitely some setbacks with COVID um, but I think that things are are moving forward again so I, I'm really excited I, I I cannot wait to see how how they do this but um, it'll be so exciting when it when it releases. I can't wait to see it on Netflix. <laughs> um, so how involved do you get to be with the process? Um, like how involved do you want to be? And what do you like envision the movie? Like, do you have a clear vision for how you want it to turn out? So I haven't, you know, I get, I get frequent updates and that kind of thing. Um, I've been able to have some calls with the producers. Um, I don't know, honestly, how involved I'll be as it progresses. Um, I, I don't know anything about, you know, how Hollywood works, admittedly. So there's a part of me that doesn't really want much to do with it either, because I just don't know how that world works. And I feel like it's best in the hands of people who do, you know, and I'll write my next novel <laughs> at that time. So, so we'll see. I, um, you know, for those of you who've read the book, I, I'm really, really curious to see how they're, how they're going to do this. So there's, you know, I have a lot of questions, um, about that too. So no, I don't, I know I, a lot of people will ask, you know, who would be my dream cast and things like that. And I have to say, I really haven't thought about it, you know, too much because I think that when I write the book, I, I sort of envision the characters and, and I don't know, you know, exactly what actor or actress would fit them. I mean, I know that when Netflix casts somebody, it's going to be great. You know, it's going to be perfect. I myself have trouble figuring out who that person could be, you know, so, so I'm just really, you know, excited to see what they do because I know that they're going to do a phenomenal job. Uh, so lastly, uh, what's next for you with Local Woman Missing due to come out in late May? What will your book tour look like this time around in terms of the pandemic? Yeah, so it's it's all virtual, <laughs> which is, I we were talking about this earlier, you know, and virtual is, I miss seeing people in person. I miss, you know, signing books and giving people hugs and taking pictures with people and all those fun things. Um, so I'm really eager to do that again. That said, this virtual platform, you know, it has, it's just allowed me con to connect with so many more people. Um, so, so that's been really nice. And I'm so grateful that like technology has filled in this gap here when we haven't been able to see people in person. Um, so my tour for Local Women Missing, it will be all, all virtual. Um, I don't have a ton of events, but um, I have, you know, some events with libraries, some events with bookstores. Um, outside of Zoom, I have like some Facebook lives and some Instagram lives and some things like that. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to share our local woman missing with everybody. It seems like it'll be here soon. And for us here in Chicago, the, the weather will be getting warmer by May. So <laughs> lots of good things to come. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much. You were very efficient. You answered many of our questions with it. <laughs> so but that's okay because we got a lot of really good questions from our audience too. Okay. So go back and go through some of those. I'm going to start with the ones that are in the chat. Um, if you guys are still watching and you have questions you'd like to submit, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A just so we can keep a little closer track of them. But I will read off some from the chat here. Let's go back. Okay, this is a fun question, and I agree. Your at-home library behind you. How is it organized? And what are a few? Of, what are a few of your favorites that you own? Thanks. Okay, 
so this 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 first one is actually all my foreign editions that is so that's one of like the things that i'm the most proud of aside from my children <laughs> um so there's not a whole well it's organized by book so that's not super organized you know the rest are mostly color coordinated except some of them i had to get creative like i like some of those over there i'm not sure what category they they fall into so i had to get a little creative with where they go but um, yeah, I, I did the color coordinating. It was a couple books ago. I think I was on deadline and I was procrastinating. So, you know, one day I decided all the books needed to be color coordinated. <laughs> oh, and so some of, some of my favorites on there, was that the second part of the question? Um, so, um, oh my gosh, I think pretty much all of them. There's so many back there that I, um, Oh my gosh, it's really hard to pick. I think that like my favorite books of all times, I'm, I'm like struggling to find them right now, but um, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried is one of my favorite, favorite books. It's not at all in the genre that I write, but it's phenomenal. And it's about the Vietnam War for those who haven't read it, but you don't have to be a history person to read it. It's just so much about life and struggles and love and it's just war and it's just, it's a, a, a brilliant book. Um, but I think in the genre, I, mean, I think I mentioned S.J. Watson a little while ago, but um, before I go to sleep is in, in suspense novels, I feel like that sets the bar so high. If, if you haven't, if you haven't read it, or um, there's a movie too, you might have seen the movie, but um, it's about a woman that she's had some kind of trauma. I can't remember exactly what, but every night when she goes to sleep, she, she loses her whole memory so that when she wakes up the next day, she knows nothing. And, you know, about her life, she doesn't recognize her husband laying in bed next to her. And so she has to spend the day relearning everything only to lose it again when she goes to sleep the next night and of course there's you know a much bigger mystery in all of this but I it's just so smart and so I, I would say that um in psychological suspense that one's phenomenal okay so it's like 50 first dates but without Adam Sandler and not, <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> just kidding okay the next question we have, you mentioned how much you learn from other authors. Do you enjoy reading for fun and as a relaxing hobby or does it always feel like work now? <laughs> so I love reading. Um, I'm actually lately, I have to say, despite all the books back there, I'm into audiobooks um, um, these days. Just I, 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 I will usually actually have two going. Like I'll be reading a physical book and then listening to an audiobook. And um, I love the audiobooks just because I can multitask. You know, I can put the, the AirPods in and clean my bathroom, or I, I will listen to it a lot in the car. Um, so um, so I, I love that. I feel like I can. I can get through a lot that way um, because sometimes just finding the time to like sit down and read a book is, is more difficult or I feel guilty like I should be writing versus reading you know if I have time to sit down and, and work so um, but I, I read it for pleasure you know there is um, I feel like I, I read with a different eye now that I've you know been writing you know or, or I feel like I can like my editor is sitting on my shoulder as I'm reading a book and I can hear you know what my editor would say about certain things because I know what she says about you know my book when she's reading them. So I definitely have kind of like a different um, something turned on when I'm when I'm reading, but I absolutely love to read. I mean, there's there's nothing better than just like losing yourself in this book that you can't put down or, um, you know, you're doing something else and all you can think is how much you want to get back to that book you're reading and, and get back into that story. Um, here's another question from the chat. Uh, do you have any tips for a first time author or how to pique the interest of an agent or an editor? And can you describe that process? Yeah, I think that, um, so I think the one thing to, to know is just that the, these agents and editors are receiving so many manuscripts and I, I don't know exactly how many, but I'm always hearing just the vast number of submissions that they are seeing. And so, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that you can do is just make your query letter. And as, I mean, obviously your whole manuscript, you want it to be as strong as it can be, but those opening pages need to be the, the, the best you can do because, you know, for some agents, they might read a paragraph and then make a decision on if they're going to keep reading or if they're going to stop reading there. So, so, you know, put all your effort, not all your effort, but put a lot of effort into those, those first pages, those first paragraphs to just make sure that they're so incredibly sharp and same with your query letter, because for a lot of agents, again, the query letter might be all that they read. So make sure that, you know, beyond that query letter that they want to, they want to keep reading that you really hook them. 
And I feel like even as a published author, this is something that I'm always think of, thinking about when I'm writing my books. Like I know that readers have many, many choices and you might go to the library or the bookstore and you know pick, pick up the book and flip to the first page and read the first paragraph. And if you're not hooked, my book might go back on the shelf. So I think that that's just kind of a good practice as a writer, just, um, you know, realizing just how vitally important those first pages are. So I would say that for sure. And then um, just another thing is be open to advice. Um, you know, some, some agents that you're reaching out to might actually come back with some feedback or they might ask you to revise and resubmit. And I would take that to heart. You know, I know as, as a writer, it's always hard to get, um, to get you know, that kind of, to, to just want some, when someone wants you to revise it you know if you feel like this manuscript is your baby and and you might be sensitive to that but I just I have I have just there's so much value in getting that advice whether it's from an agent or or an editor or if you're part of a writer's group or if you ask you know a friend to read the manuscript and give you some feedback because I feel like as a writer you know we kind of like write with blinders on and it's just great for somebody else who doesn't know where the story is going in and who is who isn't as personally invested in the story for them to come in and give you some feedback too. Uh, when the lights go out seem to have a very different feel than your other books. Did it have a different inspiration that got you started on it or do you have any comments on that book compared to your other books? Um, no, I don't know. That was actually another one that those the other misses and when the lights go out were the only two that I did know the ending when I was writing them. Um, but beyond that, no, I feel like, um, I don't think that was the inspiration was kind of the ending. That was sort of my starting point. And then I, like with the other misses, as I was describing, I sort of like built the story up from there, um, leading to this resolution. But, um, I think that it's, it's, it's heavier emotionally than some of my other books. Um, but beyond that, no, there wasn't anything um, like intentionally different when I was writing the book. What can readers expect from the Netflix project? Will it be similar to the book or have extra twists and scenes? I honestly don't know. You know, I, like I said, I haven't had a chance to read the screenplay first. So I, I don't know. I do know because it's a movie versus like a limited TV series, they feel like they don't necessarily have as much time to, to, to change it. I mean, I, there will be changes. There are always changes. I feel like when a book becomes a movie or a TV series, but I feel like given the time constraints, you know, I'm thinking it'll um, stay mostly true to the book, but, but we'll see. And, and I think that, you know, as a writer, I went into it realizing that, you know, I, I know that things might change and I'm okay with that. You know, I think that my goal is that people get excited to see the show. And so they want to read the book first or they see the, the movie and then they want to go back and read the book after, you know, I just, I hope that it kind of brings people back to the book. Go ahead, Sam. Okay. Uh, do you have any personal relationships with other best-selling authors? If so, who? You know, I have, um, I didn't know one author, you know, before, I don't think I'd ever been to an author event or anything before I got published. And um, now I have, you know, I have many author friends and, um, you know, I've done festivals and a lot of different events where I have the opportunity to meet a lot of authors and, um, and connect on social media too. Social media has been huge. I feel like it, at making it feel just like such a, such a community, you know, and um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. I had no idea what to expect. And I, I think that, I think I imagined that there would be a lot more competition between authors, but it, that just couldn't be further from the truth. You know, the authors that I have met both in person and online have just been so warm and they're always so eager to support one another. And, you know, there just isn't that competition just because, you know, you're going to read my book doesn't mean you're not going to read some other authors, you know, readers love to read and they read widely. And, and so, um, I don't know. I just, I just, that's just been one of the biggest surprises I think that I found. And it's just such a wonderful community. And I think especially because right Writing can be isolating, you know, for the most, the most part, it's me and my characters, <laughs> you know, I spend my day with imaginary people. And so also, you know, I have wonderful 
friends in real life, but they're not writers. And so they don't get, you know, that struggle or, you know, I've got this awful review and I'm feeling upset about it, or, you know, I, I'm suffering from terrible writer's block. And, you know, they don't, they don't understand that, you know, they can empathize, but they don't really get it. So to be able to connect with these authors and be able to, you know, send them a note or call them and say, this is what I'm going through right now, you know, and it's really great to be able to connect with people that way. And it, it makes it, not feel like such an isolating job, but like really like you're part of, you know, this community of writers. Awesome. Okay, guys, we are going to move into um, questions from the Q&A. And which I lost. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is a good question. Do you have a favorite out of all the books that you've written? Oh, so that's, that's a very good question. It's a hard question. It's, um, you know, like they're your children and it's hard to pick a favorite, but I would say, I would say the good girl and it's not necessarily the book itself, but the experience was so unlike any, you know, the experience that I've had with any of the books after that, you know, when I wrote The Good Girl, it was for one at my, at my own pace, you know, I did not have a deadline. I had no idea if the book would ever be published or if I'd want to get it published. So there weren't those pressures that, you know, I've had with some of the other books, but I think too is, you know, I think that that was just the first book that I really fell in love with. And, um, you know, like I said earlier, I started writing it right after my daughter was born. So, so many of my memories of writing that book are with my daughter and then my daughter and son, you know, as babies and then toddlers in the house when I was writing. And, you know, just, I think of them like on the playroom floor and I'm sitting there with my laptop writing and just things like that. You know, I just feel like that book just goes hand in hand with my, my kids' earliest days. And so for, for a number of reasons, it's just, it's really special to me, you know, and then obviously that was the, the first book that I got published and that really launched my career. That's cool. It's totally understandable. Which books recently have you enjoyed reading and what is a future release that you're excited about? That's not your own. Yeah. So, um, Jennifer, Jennifer Hillier's, um, Little Secrets came out in 2020 and that book just, blew me away. I mean, just it's so incredibly good. Um, so that's, that's phenomenal. If so, if you haven't read that one and then, um, another one that I read recently is, um, Christina McDonald and it's called do no harm. And that one, that one just came out in like February. I want to say it's pretty recent. Um, that one's, that one's really great. It's about uh, the, the woman's the mother, she's a doctor, the, her husband is a, a police officer and their son is diagnosed with, um, cancer and, they, she, she needs to find some money in a hurry to be able to, to pay for her um, son's life-saving cancer treatment. And so she does some really terrible things to, um, to raise the money. And it's, it's really, it's a thriller. It raises a lot of moral issues and you really kind of can ask yourself, like, what would you do? We don't know what we would do if we were in that situation. So, um, so it's kind of interesting to just see. So that one, it's, it's a page turner. It's really emotional. Those are kind of my favorite thrillers. Um, one that is coming out soon is, um, I got a sneak peek of Carolyn Kepney's, um, You Love Me. It's like the next Joe book in the, the You series. So that one is out April, early April. And, um, I just finished that one and I'm actually right now reading the newest Paula Hawkins book, which comes out in August. I'm, I'm only like 50 pages in, but I'm totally hooked already. So keep that one on your radar. Um, your book covers are unique, but still distinctive and that the reader immediately knows it's a Mary Kubica book just by sight. Do you have input on the covers or is that determined just by the publishers? Yeah, so we have this wonderful art department over there. Um, and I've had the, the same person has worked on all of my covers. So that's been pretty, pretty incredible. Um, the way it works is that usually, you know, my editor will prep the, the arts department kind of on the books and um, they always ask for, you know, just kind of 
all the information, you know, what do what, I, because the art team does not actually have time to read all of the books, you know, they're making so many covers. So, so they get the information, you know, what do they, what's the setting like, what do all the characters look like and things like that. And then they kind of go from there. Um, so the first couple of books, I think my first three books, I want to say I'm, they're on my wall on the other side of the computer. So I keep looking at them to remember. Um, but the first three, they showed me a cover and I was just blown away. They were perfect. Um, and then, so I didn't, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of input for me other than to describe what the characters looked like. But then when it came to my fourth book, Every Last Lie, there was a conversation about trying to move away from the faces that we'd had on the first couple books. And that alone made me nervous just because I felt like readers had come to, you know, expect faces on my books. And it just, it, it made me nervous. To, to get away from that. But the I understood the reasoning too. It just seems like at the time, at least faces were on kind of every suspense novel out there. So we wanted something a little different. Um, but so the first cover that they showed me, I did not like, and that had never happened to me before. So I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, um, could I say something? Were they going to care that I didn't like it? I just didn't know what to expect, but I did say something because it just, I felt like the cover just really didn't suit the book. And, and they were fantastic. They worked with me. We had a lot of conversations about it. I was able to get on the phone with, um, with the, the, people from the art team and kind of talk through, you know, what was working, what wasn't working and come to um, a resolution that everybody loved. So that was really great. And then actually, so the other misses actually, the cover at the beginning that I saw was the same picture, the same graphic, except it was red. It was all reds and grays and blacks versus it's kind of like a greenish yellow co color now. And so it's just kind of fun to see. Um, it was decided that red maybe skewed like more horror versus suspense. And um, so it's just kind of fun to sort of see the the way that the books, um, just so the covers kind of the changes they go through. Local Women Missing had a different cover actually to begin with that I, I, it was, it was so, so, and my publisher, they decided on their own that it wasn't, you know, strong enough. And when I saw the cover that it has right now, I was just blown away. It's different than all my other covers. There's trees, there's no face, and there's this pink font. And I just thought it was brilliant. I mean, it suits the story so well. Yeah, I have to say, I really love the cover for Local Woman Missing. It really catches your eye. And I know you're not really supposed to judge a book by its cover, <laughs> but readers do. Like a big draw to, for a lot of readers is, is this cover amazing? And I got to check out this book now because just the cover is so good. So mm -hmm. now that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying because I, I know I judge books by covers, you know, but if you don't know what you want, you know, if you don't go into the library looking for a specific book, that's what's going to grab your eye. And so, um, you know, when it comes to some things like covers, you know, I know what I like and don't like, but it's so interesting to get input from others too, to just know like what is going to grab a reader when they look at it. Uh, here's another question. Um, do you have a favorite character you've written and have you ever written a character that's based off of your life or your own experiences? That's, that's a good question. So I think that the characters that, um, I'm drawn the most to are, you know, kind of the ones that maybe um, like there's more to them than meets the eye or they just like really grow and develop a lot throughout the story. So I think Colin in The Good Girl and then Willow in Pretty Baby are probably two of my favorite characters that I've written or just the ones that I feel like I connected with on a really emotional level. Um, I have not written any characters that like is me <laughs> or, you know, a version of me. But there are a lot of things, you know, I, I think that all the mothers, there are many mothers in my books. And I think that as a mother myself, I tend to, you know, empathize with them a little bit more maybe. Um, but they're definitely, they're all, you know, they're all fictional. I, I feel like I couldn't look at any of my characters and say that one's the most like me. I definitely think, you know, they're all definitely um, unique. <laughs> Okay, so um, do you generally try to write a book each year? Do you happen to already be working on the next? So after Local Woman Missing? So I, for the most part, have done about a book a year. Um, uh, there was maybe, there were a couple in there that were maybe more like 18 months, but for the most part, it is about a book a year. Um, I am working on another book right now. Um, I'm not far into it. So, um, I can't really say anything about it because I feel like I don't know what's going to stick and what's not. I'm, I'm literally like 22 pages in. <laughs> um, so a lot to figure out still. Um, so this one, 
I'm guessing we'll actually be out in 2023. So there might be a gap in there in 2022, just by the time that I'm finished with this book and it goes through, you know, all those early stages that it does, maybe like early 2023. Great. Um, so we touched on this a little bit, but what would you suggest for new authors to get their name or book out there? Yeah, you know, I think too, um, I said a few things earlier. I think though, um, social media is huge. Um, there's, I, 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 that's too, you know, I was talking about just how warm and welcoming everybody was, but I never, you know, like before the good girl came out when I had zero social media following, you know, it was just really surprising the number of authors that were willing to communicate with me and kind of welcoming me into that group. And um, so I definitely would say, you know, um, social media, you know, whether you're someone who's published, going to be published, an aspiring writer, um, go on social media, follow some of your best, your favorite authors, you would be surprised at how many are eagerly, you know, willing to communicate with you. And um, people will um, tweet me, you know, with questions about writing, just, gen you know, general questions about writing. And um, I mean, I respond, the vast, vast majority of authors out there will respond. And I think it's just so great to make that connection. Um, if Twitter's not for you, you know, go on Instagram. Instagram is my personal favorite. I like seeing pictures, um, you know, but there's like this whole bookstagram community on there. And, and so it's a way to really connect with readers. Um, there are a lot of Facebook groups too for readers and writers. So look for some of those groups and, and join and start, you know, just engaging with readers, with writers. And I think that's a great way to just kind of, you know, make those relationships and, you know, for people to begin to recognize your name. Okay. Yeah. Author Twitter is definitely a thing. Um, I'm not an author, obviously, <laughs> but I mean, I follow you on Twitter and it's just like cool to see that you guys are people like you always tweet about the Cubs. I remember when the Cubs were in the series, like you were you were all over that. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca like McKay is another Chicago author author um, that I really enjoy her tweets. She's hilarious. And <laughs> okay, going back to what we were talking about, um, how do you compare your confidence in your writing voice and the publishing process now versus when you first started out? Um. So I, I have, I feel a lot more confident in my writing. That's not to say that there aren't many days that, you know, I look at what I've written that day and think it's utter garbage, you know, um, or that I don't feel very panicky every time before a new book comes out because I have no idea how it's going to do or, you know, I think that there are some of those jitters that just will never go away, no matter how, you know, how many books you've written or who you are, I feel like that's all that's just normal, but I, I know the process now. I, I, I think that I'm, I, well, I know that I've been very lucky. I think it's maybe unusual that I have been with the same publisher, all the same people for, you know, six going on seven books now. So there's so much comfort in that. Um, you know, I know what the process is going to be. There isn't, you know, sometimes things change, like the tour, the tour is going to be virtual this year, but for the most part, it's the same process. And so there's so much comfort in that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I feel like that, you know, I just feel very good where I am. And I feel like I've gained a lot more confidence throughout the process. Um, here's another question. Will you be attending Lit Fest Chicago as an author this year? I will not be attending this year. And do you have any family members or friends that read your rough drafts before you submit them to your agent or editor? <laughs> That's a really good question. So, um, so typically I'd say, well, the answer actually is no, nobody sees it before my editor, not even my husband. Um, so I, you know, I think that because I started working with her with the first book and I just kind of knew how much I trusted her and kind of how strong and important that relationship was and also how subjective writing would can be, you know, I could, I could share a draft with 10 people and they could give me 10 different, you know, 10 different pieces of advice. So, you know, I think for me as a, my goal as a writer is to get my manuscripts to my editor as quickly as I can. That said, um, with the other misses, because I knew the ending and I had told it to my editor, you know, before I started writing the book, we both knew where the book was going. So it was hard for both of us to edit, uh, edit it objectively. So after she and I were done with, you know, 
the edits, like the best that we could do. I actually, um, I'm in a book club and I actually got like five ladies from my book club and asked them to read it. So at that point it was a cleans up version, you know, my editor and I had gone through it, but it wasn't done. So I asked these, these handful of ladies to read it because they had no idea where the book was going. And it was so helpful because, you know, they could say, you know, on page 38 or whatever, you know, this is what I was thinking was happening. And if they were right, you know, then I knew, okay, I've got to pull back on something on page 38. <laughs> so it was a really, really valuable experience. And then I actually did it again in, in Local Women Missing there. One of the characters is a doula and two of my very good friends are doulas. So, you know, I had done a lot of research to create this doula character, but, you know, there's nothing like the real thing. So after after I was done, I, I same thing, my editor and I had already gone through it. But then I asked these two friends of mine, can you please read it, you know, and tell me anything, you know, that I have done wrong with the with, with the doula. So it's really, it's really been very helpful. Do you get to have any input in choosing narrators for your audiobooks? Yeah, I actually do. So now that I listen to audiobooks, you know, more myself, that's been, it's such a fun process. And I know how important a really good narrator is. So usually what happens is that my publisher will send me like some, like three or four, um, possibilities for each of the narrators in the book, you know, and they'll send me some sound clips so that I can listen to them. And it's kind of a cool process because I feel like, you know, I'll, I'll listen to one and I'll think, oh, that's right. Or, or no way that doesn't sound like this character at all, you know, whatever version of this character I have in my head. So it's, it's fun to, to do that. I really enjoy being a part of that process. Yeah, that's great. I experienced the good girl for the first time through audio and I loved the narrators. They were fantastic. They did such a good job. Um, do you have any experience with children's books or plan to write any? Um, I, I thought for the longest time I was, I really kept thinking this was when my kids were younger and I kept thinking, I want to read a, write a book that my kids can actually read. And so I thought it would be so fun to do like a YA thriller. And I'm not, I'm still not, you know, um, not, not going to do it, but I don't know, you know, time got away from me and, and it never happens, but I, I like to read YA books. And I think that that would be really fun to do. That would be cool to see your name on a YA book. I would read that. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So our last question um, for the night before we wrap up, do you have a website and do you maintain it yourself? I do have a website. It's just um, www.maricabika.com. And so I do the, I, I do maintain it. I, you know, someone else designed it and she does like the big changes, you know, like if I have a new book and need a whole new page added for it, that's beyond me. But when it comes to like adding events and things like that, I do maintain it myself. Great, I'm just gonna throw that link there in the chat. So if anybody wants to check it out, she has her events listed there, um, links where you can buy her books, all that good stuff. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you guys had a really good question. Everyone in the audience, that was that was fantastic, really. That was one of the better author events I think I've, I've done. So that was really cool. Um, I just want to thank you again, Mary, for being with us. Um, it was a lot of fun. I think everybody really enjoyed it. I want to thank Sam and Tawny, my colleagues, for helping me out with the interview tonight. And of course, all of you in the audience for joining us and continuing to support AAPLD through this pandemic and, and into the future. So um, please check out our events calendar. There's lots of good stuff. One thing I do want to spotlight for you guys really quickly is that we are going to be welcoming bestselling author John Sanford on Wednesday, April 14th for a fireside chat. And guys, let me tell you, if he signs on sitting in front of a fireplace, I'm going to lose it. Like that would just be awesome. Um, I'm obviously very easily amused. So um, the other thing, we offer so, so many great book clubs through the library. Um, so I don't honestly know much about them. So I'm going to let Sam kind of take over and give some insight into the different clubs we have. And yeah, I mean, even if you're not an Algonquin patron, you don't have a card with us, you know, you're still welcome to join. So we have a whole bunch of book clubs. Um, I, I do not have a ton of information about all of them um, because um, my staff run only four of them. So I was just going to touch on those really quick and I can pull up the others and tell you what they're called. Um, but I don't feel comfortable like 
telling you exactly what they're about. Maybe Tawny can jump in for those and we'll see. Um, so we do Stranger Than Fiction, which is a nonfiction book club and we meet the first Tuesday of the month. Um, and we've talked about lots of stuff from historical stuff. Uh, true crime is a big thing for us. Um, things about music, it, it's just lots of different stuff, a good variety. Um, our second one is Forever Young, which is young adult books, but the book club is for adults and they meet on the second Monday. All of this is virtual, by the way. Um, they've been, they've read all kinds of different YA too, some fantasy, some thriller, some um, mystery, uh, graphic novel. They're doing a graphic novel for April, so they hit all of the different areas there. Um, a newer book club is The Book Wizards, which is all fantasy. Um, I believe this is... Uh, we're going on our third month with them um, and they meet the second Tuesday of the month. Um, so they, they're reading lots of different kinds of fantasy. Um, and then the newest book club, which starts in April, meets on the third Tuesday is The Nail Biters and that is a thriller book club. So um, we'll be reading all kinds of thrillers, not just psychological, but medical and uh, sci-fi thriller. Um, Ancient Enigma, it's all kinds of stuff. It's going to be fun. So those are the four book clubs that me and my staff run at the branch. Um, Tawny, are you able to speak to the other ones? I can speak for at least one. I'm the host of the Spine Crackers book club, which I'll throw a link in the chat here really quick. While so the spine, huh? I'm so sorry. While you're throwing the, the link in there, uh, thank you so much to the person who reminded me in the chat about our other book club. I can't believe I forgot it. All the horror. <laughs> All the horror. <laughs> it's a horror book club for adults. I'm so sorry. Thank you for the reminder. Um, and they meet on the last Tuesday of the month. So I'll just quick uh, rep Spine Crackers, which is the book club that I will be hosting. And our next meeting is on Friday, April 2nd at 10 a.m. It's all virtual again. Spine Crackers is sort of a general fiction book club. We read a little bit of everything, mainly contemporary fiction, a little bit of romance, a little bit of mystery. Um, the next book we'll be reading is We Ride Upon Sticks by Barry uh, Quan Barry, and it's an interesting story of teenage girls who kind of draw upon witchly powers in Salem, Massachusetts, so they can win like their field hockey state final, and it's a lot of fun. So I can speak to that one. Um, Sam, I'll let you quickly maybe go over the others that are at the Harnish branch. Okay, um, so we have a, a cozy, cozy mystery, I believe, cozy mystery book club, um, cozy corner book club, um, which is actually for adults and teens, and they meet on the first Wednesday. Um, I'm so sorry, Tawny, which you did spine crackers, right? Yeah, <laughs> spine crackers in mine. <laughs> but I was also looking at the same time. Um, there is a Page Turner's Youth Book Club for kids, grades five to eight, if you have kids that are interested in joining a book club, um, and they meet on the second Thursday. Um, also something a little bit newer, Happily Ever After Book Club. Um, they meet on the third Monday, so they read um, mostly things with happy endings, so if you like that kind of thing. Um, we do have a classics book club called Enjoying the Classics, and they meet on the third Wednesday. And our newest book club, which it was a com combination of two previous book clubs, um, they've just combined them into one is a Library Reads book club. Um, and Library Reads is um, just a, a place where we go to get um, uh, librarians vote on, on what their favorite books are as they're coming out. And they come out with this list of um, books. I can't, don't remember how many. It's it's quite a few, um, like two pay, like double-sided flyers for sure. Um, of uh, books that librarians have voted on and they've decided that they're awesome and um, they wanna recommend them. Um, and it's just, uh, this book club will focus on the books that have been on those lists. So when oh, they meet, hang on, um, the third Thursday. <laughs> so clearly we have a lot to offer. Um, we don't expect you guys to remember all those dates. We have a lot of book clubs. Um, and I just wanna point out that Library Reads is run by a former staff member um, who's probably in the audience tonight and she's very loved and she does a great job. So make sure you guys check out some of those offerings. Again, you can go through um, our calendar and just check out everything we have. We have a truly awesome staff here at AAPLD. You know, we're blessed to be able to offer so much to you guys. So 
Again, thank you for attending tonight and for your patience, for all your wonderful questions. If you guys have an extra minute or two, when we close the webinar, there's gonna be a short survey that pops up. Um, so you can give us the, some feedback on your experience tonight and you know how could it be better or would you like to see this again in the future type thing. So if you have a minute, just fill it out. And again, this recording will be edited and then it will be posted to our library's YouTube within like the next few days. So be looking out for that. Yeah. And thank you all very much. Have a wonderful night. You guys take care, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you. Bye, everybody.